Good morning, Laura van der Berg here. I'd like to start with a personal story with apologies, simply to introduce today's thought. I had two fathers. My mother married Archie, my first father, for sad reasons which I don't need to go into here, and 18 months later I was born. She divorced Archie when I was a year old. When I was three years old, she married Albert, known as Dee. He was the true love of her life. Dee was such a wonderful dad to me, and later, when Dorothy, my sister, was born, he showed absolutely no difference in his love for us both. And I had the happiest childhood, seldom even thinking of him as a stepdad. He was just my wonderful, loving teddy bear of a dad. And we had a Christian home, second to none, with the best parents. Why am I telling you this personal history? Simply because I want to contrast my feelings between my two dads without judgment. I've made my peace with my biological dad, Archie, a long time ago. I'll avoid boring or embarrassing you with the details, but in broad strokes I want to paint the background for reasons which will become clear in a short while. Archie was very absent in my life, and apart from a few painful encounters, I had little interaction with him. I developed a big indifference towards him and I cut him out of my adult life and also cut my children off from him to my shame. A year before we were sent from Palabora to Sunnyside Methodist Church, a young Presbyterian minister by the name of Gus Hunter confronted me and he told me that God had revealed to him that I had unfinished business with my father which needed forgiveness and healing. This was amazing. He didn't know me at all. I was deeply challenged, but being busy with my family managed to push the challenge deep down, and I did nothing. We began our ministry in Sunnyside, and if you had asked me if I was at odds with anyone, I would have laughed and denied it. I was certain I had no anger, unforgiveness, or hostility towards anyone. I even managed to convince myself that I had no ill feelings towards my father. Whilst at Sunnyside, another young man came into focus in our congregation. George Jones was being called by God into full-time ministry. George received his first appointment as a candidate and was sent to Fondabale Park. That was like a punch in my stomach. My father Archie lived there with his wife and her daughter. I knew this was no coincidence and God was calling me to account, challenging me again to build a bridge towards Archie. I told George all about my history and he and his wife departed for Fondabale Park and I could just tell George had the proverbial bit between his teeth. It wasn't long before he had met my father, befriended him, gone fishing with him and led him to make a commitment of his life to Jesus. George then began nagging me to drive down and to be reconciled to my now Christ-following father. But I had every excuse. I was the aggrieved party, the victim. Why did Archie not come to me? And so I ducked and dived the Lord's summons for some months. My eldest son was 10 years old when we were transferred to the Cape. And three weeks before we left, I couldn't make any more excuses. So we packed the family into the car and travelled to meet my father. I found him pacing up and down the pavement. And as I got out of the car, he ran to me. He threw his arms around me and weeping, kept crying out, I'm sorry, Laura, I'm sorry, forgive me, forgive me. It was the most moving and beautiful moment of reconciliation, which I will treasure in my heart forever. 
We moved down to Cape Town and three weeks later, I got a call from his wife to say my father had galloping cancer of the throat and he died within a week. I still shake when I think that if we hadn't met each other a short month before he died, I would have lived the rest of my life with guilt and shame and regret. It's not a pretty story of my Christian witness, and I needed God's forgiveness. And that's something he and I have dealt with throughout my life. What I want to highlight today is that my story could be many other folks' story. We may be people at peace with almost everyone around us, but there may be that one unresolved issue in our lives that God is wanting to challenge us to face up to today, to try and find healing. We can be loving and friendly to our friends in the church, but ignore the elephant in the room who is the friend or relative God is calling us to reach. Lockdown has also made it easier to avoid confrontations and to excuse our reluctance to to build bridges of understanding and to forgive. Masks can be more than cloth coverings on our faces, preventing the spread of a virus. They can be something else that we hide behind in in our churches, amongst our friends. A really awful concept to me in our English language is to tolerate someone. No loving, No active dislike, not wanting to harm them, but just ignoring them, avoiding them. It's that lukewarm state in our inner being that caused Jesus to declare, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. We could say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, or even, I have friends, I'm happy, I don't need anything more. But Jesus comes right back at us in that passage and he says, But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Harsh words. But I have been there. I've been ignoring the reality of my wretched life and witness. And it's so cold. It's an awful numbness. Tolerating someone, being indifferent to them, being lukewarm towards them is so far from what God our Father wants for our relationships. Sadly, there may even be some of us who go through periods when we become distracted from Jesus because our lives seem to be going so well. We slip into a pattern of being just a little indifferent to our Christ walk, to God himself. It's called backsliding and we do it so easily. Our Bibles gather dust. We are just so busy, so busy, too busy for prayer, to attend worship. We even skip online worship because we have other things to do or people to see. And we gradually nibble our way lost, as a wise man used to say. We are told to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. To be involved with our mind by studying his word. To be ready with our speech to witness. To be diligent in our service. To be compassionately busy with our hands and feet in sharing God's love for others. To be learning to love God with every fiber of our being, with our emotions, our love, our spirit, our soul, every part of us. That's the way God loves us. God isn't indifferent or lukewarm to us. He takes us very, very seriously. He has gone all the way and has laid down his very life for us on Calvary's cross. And Jesus goes on and he commands us to love each other as we love ourselves. And I'm sure we all try to give ourselves the best treatment we're able to in every part of our lives. 
Jesus makes it clear that we need to forgive our enemies, those who persecute us or make life difficult for us. He tells us, and Scripture reminds us elsewhere, not to judge and criticize and find fault, but rather to bear one another's burdens, to comfort and console one another, to have respect for others, to try to understand, to act with justice and mercy. That all sounds a very far cry from cold tolerance, putting up with someone, living past that person as if they were an unpleasant smell under our noses. Perhaps you can truly say that you have no feelings or indifference or coldness to another. And if that's so, I'm sure you make God's heart very happy. But I don't know, perhaps like me, that's not entirely true. And I ask you to examine the folk outside your inner circle of loved ones and friends. Are you sure that there is no one you know deep down you should be reaching with God's love? Lots of books have been written about how to handle difficult people. And I'm sure that just outside your circle, as with me, there is someone who needs you to do more than simply tolerate them. God's love is an ever-widening circle. If we only have a compassionate, deep love for the people we like, we are no better than the demons, and we are missing the whole point of the command God gave us to love others and to make disciples of all people. So I want to challenge us all today to try to reach beyond our circle. Reach especially to the person you only tolerate right now. Let us all make our circles bigger. That's how we build the kingdom of God. As the psalmist put it in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any of offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Just a short prayer. Father God, some people in our lives we have lived past, we have tried to avoid. Lord God, burn their faces and their, and their souls on, into our minds today. May they become the focus of our prayer. Help us to become creative in finding ways to reach them, to cross over barriers and to widen the circle of the kingdom of God for the sake of Jesus who reached out to us with love and forgiveness. Be with us this day, we pray. Amen. Goodbye.